All right, students, welcome, welcome, welcome to class. I hope you guys are doing well. This is ACD class number two. If you weren't with us last week, welcome for the first time. If you were with us, welcome back. Uh, I'm Chase. If you weren't with us last week, I'll be your teacher for the class. And also with us today is your teaching assistant, Sarah. She is, uh, I mean, hopefully she's still, she's on right now, but she'll be commenting here in a second. If you guys have any questions for us, don't hesitate to let me know. Uh, or let us know. Sarah will comment and, and answer questions as well in the chat. Uh, but in the meantime, guys, when you get into class today and you can hear me and you can see me, please comment in the chat with just a hello or I'm here, something that lets us know that you guys are here so we can keep track of attendance. Okay? You'll also need, and Sarah, maybe after you post and just say you're here, uh, after you post, can you include uh, what students will need today? So the BO4. The BO4 ACT exam. Hey guys, welcome everybody, welcome. Everybody will need the BO4 test and the A11 test printed out. Okay, BO4 is the one that you guys had for homework. You were going to complete passages, uh, I think, two through five for homework. We'll talk about the scales and the importance of that here today a little bit. Uh, and then you'll also need the... A11 test, which is also posted in the in the Facebook classroom group. You can click files at the top and you'll see the A11 test form. Okay. Uh, or you can click, uh, or, it's, or it's posted. If you scroll down in the classroom group, you can see that the A11 test is posted there as well. So again, guys, please make sure you have that. Welcome everybody. DJ, Elena, Devin, Nayla, Maddie, Blake, Kayla, Elisa, Jane. Sophie, welcome guys. Daniel, Annabelle, you guys are all here, so welcome guys. Uh, give me one sec here. All right, so again, as soon as you guys have the A11 test, or that you confirm that you have the A11 test, please give us a thumbs up in the chat so we know you, you have it. Okay, and then on top of that, please also make sure that you have either access to your Star U student account. Please log in and open that, or access to your ACT Redbook, your tutorial. So Star U student account. If you didn't create a Star U student account yet, I'd like you to do that now. Okay, and give me one second. I'll post that. Okay, and you guys can access that by clicking by either downloading the app. I just also posted okay guys so again I want everybody to have access to either their tutorial or their app so that you guys can uh, be doing the practice questions that we go through today with the punctuation section and the run-on section, okay? Please make sure that you guys have that. If you weren't with us last week, you guys can click those links or download the app. I wanna make sure that it's free. It's free to create a student account. It takes like two minutes and we're gonna be using that during the course of the class. So please make sure that you guys download that and create a student account now if you haven't already. If you do have one, then please feel free to have that open in addition to your tutorial just so you get familiarity with how it works and so that you know you can be doing it on test day because we're going to be using that on test day as we talked about last week. And we'll get started here in one minute, guys. Okay, guys, so with regards to that BO4 test for homework that you guys had last week, because we have some new students, we're not going to mention that we're not going to talk about that BO4 test today. But what we are going to do is we're going to provide you with a score report, okay? And what these advanced score reports can do for you is they, they will tell you every single question type. First of all, you can plug in your answers. And Sarah, this is the first piece of homework. It's for all students to plug in their ACT BO4 English answers into the score report. Guys, don't worry about it now because we haven't even shown you the score report yet. But you're going to plug in your answers. We're going to provide you guys with, uh, with details on how to do that. And then you're going to send a picture... Or rather, you're going to send a copy of that English score report to admin at startutors.net. So Sarah, that'll be the first piece of homework is that everybody's going to fill out their BO4 score report. They're going to fill in, you know, you know how it works, obviously. 
They're going to fill it out and then they're going to send it to admin at startutors.net if you could write that down and that's the first piece of homework. Again, guys, don't worry about that yet. We'll talk much more extensively about the school reports next week and how they work. But basically, once you plug in your answers, it will tell you the exact question type you missed and it will correspond to the lesson in the app or the lesson in your tutorial, whichever one you want to work out of. It will correspond to that exact lesson. So if you've noticed right within your score report that you missed 15 punctuation questions, then it's pretty good. It's a pretty good idea, right, to pay attention today for sure, but also to go back and make sure that you guys are you're aware of it, right? That you that you know that you should review punctuation because clearly it was something that you struggled with on this BO4 test or maybe the first uh, the first one. Okay, cool. Thanks, Sarah. That's great. Okay, and so we're going to get started, guys. So today, so if you haven't watched, for new students, if you haven't watched last week's lesson, the first lesson, please, please, please make sure that you do so this week. I think for most of the students can attest from last week, the ones that were here for last week's class, I think most students will attest that that's a pretty important lesson in terms of understanding and reducing the anxiety on this exam. And so if you guys haven't seen that lesson, or even if you have seen it and you want to rewatch it to get more familiarity, I highly, highly encourage you guys to do that. Okay, does that make sense? Highly, highly encourage you guys to do that. It's going to be really, really important that you understand that, that you see that. Okay, because that scale is so, so, so critical. Okay. So guys, for today, we're going to start with a little warm-up. And then unlike last week where we talked extensively for the first hour about the scale and all that, we're going to get into some uh, some grammar review today, talking about punctuation rules. Now, I cannot stress how boring this is going to be. There is no amount of time or effort that I can spend talking about this stuff that is going to make you guys excited to learn about punctuation. Just it's just I wish when I was a kid, instead of teachers like kind of patronizing me, being like, "This is so fun," it was never fun. It was never going to be fun. And realistically, unless you guys love commas for some unknown reason, this is not going to be one of those things where you wake up today and be like, man, that was such a great lesson. Can't wait to go study more today. So if you know that and I'm telling you that going into this, then it has to mean something to you. And so what I'm going to talk about before we get started is how important these punctuation and run-ons lessons are today. First of all, how easy they are. This is sixth grade grammar review, truly sixth grade. You guys are going to see that today. But it's not fun to do sixth grade grammar when, you know, whatever, if you're an NFL football fan and the game's on a night, that's or to, next week or whatever the Super Bowl is, right? It's not gonna be it's not gonna be fun to do this in instead of watching things like that, right? Making those sacrifices because it is gonna be boring. So you gotta figure out a way, as we talked about last week, to set goals for yourself, right? To find that reading time. Sarah posted it for homework last week. How do I find time to be a better reader, right? To read an hour a day or an hour a week, whatever we said. Right? How do I find that time? Because if, if you don't, you're just going to turn this page today and be like, this stinks. Okay? And, and so you have to find the means to the end. Right? It's a means to an end. That's what we got to be thinking about. Okay? And to clarify that point even further, can everybody please make sure that you have the A11 English test open? It starts with from salad to symphony. Okay? It looks like this, from salad to symphony. Don't Just make sure that you have that and that you have that in front of you now. Okay, you just saw what it looked like, but before we start with that, we're going to do a quick warm-up passage on the A11 test, and then we're going to go through all this content review, okay, and then we're going to do a, a passage at the end of class as well, and then you guys will have three more passages from the A11 test for homework, and we'll talk about that as we go. But guys, before we start with that, I want to reiterate two things, or really three things. One is the ACT English section, if you want it to be, is by far the easiest of the sections on the ACT. Okay, and that's for everybody. Even if you're a great math student, okay, and you don't love English class as much, ACT English is still the easiest. And I, I Sarah, who's sitting in class with you guys, right, was in this position a couple years ago as a student in this class, and now she's your teaching assistant. Sarah got a perfect score, as we talked about last week, but Sarah's a better math student than I'll probably ever be. And yet her English ACT English test score ended up being higher, okay, than her math score. Okay, if you wonder how that works, remember that we talked extensively about the scale that you can get, if you got, you know, if you get 31, 29, 31, and 30, I think that math works out, 
right? The scale actually rounds up. So you can get, I don't think it does round up, right? Let's say this is a 30. You can get, if you get a 31, 30, 31, 30, right? That averages, those four sections are gonna average to a 30.5, which rounds up to a 31. Okay, so if we can keep this English section score, if you know that your English score is always consistent, and it will be, if you memorize this, if you choose to do this stuff, your English section score can always be consistent. This is the most important section for every student. This is the most important section on the test because it's the easiest. Okay, it might not be the easiest for you right now today, but it can be the easiest for everybody. And that is just so, so, so critical. Okay, because if you know going into every test that this section is going to go well, right? And, and I've seen great, I've seen poor English students, great math students get to a point where they can't go below 32. They get 32 plus on the English test every single time. Once that happens, it's such a great feeling knowing that there's some consistency, that the first test out of the gate on the ACT, that, hey, I'm going to knock this thing out. And that feels great. That gets that momentum going that we talked about last week. So we got to pay attention to that. On top of that, okay, so Sarah just said it, right? You can't take this section for granted. This is at every level of the test. If you're at a 36, if you're at a 30, if you're at a 23 right now, this is the most important section. You should focus on this section five times as much as any other section until this one is where it needs to be. Every single student should score 30 or above on the English section if they have work ethic because this is all rules-based stuff and we'll talk more about that today. Okay, so most importantly, what we're going to see today, and this is what I want you, everything that we write on the screen, guys, is stuff that I want you guys to be writing down as well. You can write in your tutorials. Those are yours. You can write on a separate notebook if, if you feel more comfortable with that. But everything we write on the screen, everything Sarah mentions in the comments section should be written down because it's super important. Okay, but the punctuation stuff that we're going to talk about today, right? So in kind of subcategories, we have punctuation, and then we have these run-on sentences and fragments. Right, but of these, of punctuation, if you can believe it, there are going to be 12, probably 12 out of 75 of the total questions on English, right? There are 75 total questions on English. 12 of those, 12, are going to deal with punctuation. That means that going into the test, that if you pay attention to today's lesson and you commit to memorizing everything we talk about, you will go into every single ACT English test because these are all rules based. There is nothing about punctuation that is not defined rules, just like in math, right? It's like a math problem. That if you go into every single test knowing you're going to get 15% of the questions right, no matter what, and on top of that, a lot of these questions are actually graded as hard questions, graded as hard question types, right? They're level three questions. Okay, that doesn't mean that they're any less value or more value than other questions, but they're graded, they're, they're, they're classified, I guess is probably a better word. They're classified as hard questions. That gives you guys huge advantages because if you know the rules, if you take the time to memorize these, not only do you get 15% of the questions right, but you get 15% of the rules-based difficult questions right, and that is so, so huge. Okay, because most students don't want to take the time to memorize the rules that we're going to talk about today. Can everybody give me two thumbs up in the chat if this all makes sense? If you guys are ready to go, if you feel like, hey, I'm going to pay attention today because I know this is going to be important. Two thumbs up in the chat if that's you. Okay, and then we'll get going here. Great guys, that's perfect. Okay, so if that's all good, if everybody feels comfortable with that stuff, what we're gonna do first is we're gonna set the timer for every ACT English test. Each passage, you'll have nine minutes to complete that passage. Okay, there are 15 questions total, you'll have nine minutes to complete it. But for today, just like we did last week, and then we're going to practice this again at the end once we've had a chance to go through lessons today, like punctuation and run-ons. I'm going to give you guys 11 minutes, okay? You're going to get 11 minutes to complete the first passage. So we're looking again at A11 English, okay? A11 English, passage one, 
And I'm going to give you guys 11 minutes. Just like last week, if you're finishing way too early, that's an issue, right? We can't, we don't want to finish this too early. So we're looking at passage one. I'm going to give you guys 11 minutes to complete this. In a perfect world, what I'd, ra- what I'd most want you guys to do is if you see something underlined, right? If something's underlined, which is makes also makes English such an easy section, they point to where exactly where you need, right? It's not like math or science where you have to think about what they're asking. They're, they're telling you, right, look here. They're saying, look here and correct the mistake, right? So if you guys know that, then you should be looking there and thinking about, okay, what mistake are they giving me here to try to correct? So that's what we're thinking about. So I'm going to give you guys 11 minutes because I really want you to take your time to guarantee accuracy. Because as we talked about last week, the only thing that matters on this test, it has nothing to do with timing. The only thing that matters on this test is that we guarantee accuracy. Okay? Does that make sense, guys? Okay, so with that in mind, can everybody give me, uh, say, good to go in the chat? One final thing. I'm going to set the timer here for 11 minutes. You guys will see that populate here. Say good to go in the chat. If you guys are good to start, you'll have 11 minutes to complete passage one. That's questions one through 15. Okay, just passage one, you can stop. And I don't want you guys to finish too early. If you finish a little early, that's fine. But you should really try to take advantage of this extra time to really try to understand these questions. So questions one through 15 which is passage number one. As soon as I see enough good to goes, so we got a couple coming through here. Great, passage one, questions one through 15. You guys get 11 minutes, which is a little bit more time than you otherwise would. So really try to take advantage of that. Okay, but otherwise you get 11 minutes on this section and your time starts now, guys. Good luck. Passage one, A11, and then we'll get into more, more stuff. This is just a warm up. Good luck, guys.
Hey guys, this is where it's important, right? If you're finishing, it's about four minutes left. If you're, if you're already close to being finished, then you got to slow down because we got to go back and look, especially at the ones where we have to go back and reread, like what should the author add this sentence structure? How should these sentences be organized? We got to make sure we take our time on those, okay? So you got about four minutes left and really take your time trying to identify what the question is asking, okay? Four minutes. Talk to you guys in a second. Oh, and Sarah, can you give me a thumbs up? Uh, can you post... Can you get ready to post the passage one answers for the A11 test? That'd be great, thanks. Pretty good, it's just under a minute left. Keep working through it. Okay, guys, 10 seconds. Sarah will post the answers as soon as you guys are done. Okay, but, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how important some of this punctuation stuff that we're gonna talk about today is going to be. Okay, so there's the timer. Sarah, when you, see, when you hear this, feel free to post the answers for passage number one. Okay, and then I'm gonna show you guys some things that are super, super important. Guys, while, we're, while Sarah's posting those, how did everybody feel on those questions? Did it feel like you guys were, like, you understood it? Like there was, there was some, and Sarah just posted them for 1 through 15. Did you guys feel like there was some, some uh, clarity with what you were looking at on, the, on that test? 
And I'm going to show you guys again, the, the idea behind all of this is that we truly, truly try to take a look at what is underlined. Okay? So guys, let me know how you felt. How did everybody feel as they went through it? How, how did everybody do? Did anybody get all the questions right? There are little things, right? So uh, again, when we see things like this, right? Question number three. As evidence read, I said 12 out of the 75 questions. Within the first three questions, we have, we have a relatively easy punctuation question. And we know it's punctuation because we see everything that's underlined. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so if we see this, right, if we see that everything that's underlined, there is punctuation here, we have to make determinations as to what's going on. So on number three, it says gourds, daikon radishes, and other vegetables, right? Right, very easily, we can see these commas form a list. So, right, that, and that's all that is. This is a subject, are used. Do we need any other pieces of punctuation? Well, we definitely don't need a semicolon, as we're going to talk about today, okay? And I'll tell you why. Any time that you guys see a semicolon on the test, right? If you see this on the test, it is the exact same thing as a period. We'll talk more about that in depth today. But if you see a semicolon, you have to know that the only constitution for a semicolon on the ACT English test is if you have two full sentences, just like if you have a period. And we'll talk more about that again today. But that gives you an ultimate advantage if you really know how a semicolon is supposed to be used as it applies to the ACT. Because it means that if you see a semicolon, there's only there's one and only one rule for that. So B can be eliminated, and then it's then hopefully it's a lot easier to see what the right answer is, right? Are used to round out the orchestra. The answer then, right, for number three just has to be D. And again, it's typically the semicolon that tends to throw students off because we just forget about why it's why it needs to be used, and and it's such an easy problem. Can everybody give me a thumbs up if they, if that makes sense? Okay, same thing here, like with question number eight. So now two of the first eight questions, that's 25%. That's even higher than I had suggested, right? Two of the first, two of the first uh, eight questions were punctuation. This is another punctuation question, as you guys will see today. Okay. And as we're looking through this, it says other factors, like the diameter of the hole and changes in the air temperature and humidity, if something is not underlined on the test, okay? If something is not underlined on the test, then it's assumed to be correct. So like all things with punctuation or all things with ACT English, if we see this comma, right, there's a comma after the word humidity, that should clue us in that something is happening, happening, right? Okay, so other factors also affect the sound quality. Okay, so other factors like the diameter of hole, this comma right here suggests that there needs to be another comma after the word factors. Okay, not a dash. If this was a dash down here, Right on number eight, then the dash would be the right answer. But because we don't have another dash that starts or closes out the sentence, it's a comma that starts it. So we know that the answer then has to be H for number eight. Okay, do you guys see that though? Right, Where, that this comma here is a. This is what we call a phrase. Well, again, we'll talk more about this today. But Sarah's ability or my ability to do well on the English section has nothing to do with some God-given talent of of grammar. Right, we didn't just. Wake up one day and I was like, oh, that looks like a phrase. I think there should be a comma there. That didn't happen. It's just a lot of looking over this stuff and thinking about it and really giving it some effort. And then every time you see a piece of punctuation that's underlined, right, look at number 11. So now three of the first 11 questions have been punctuation questions. And I know that because punctuation is the easiest type question type to identify, right? We see a comma here, so it must be punctuation. Still the most critical ingredient in, cr in creating high quality sound Wang Dong, Wei Dong says, right? Wei Dong says is the vegetable's high water con content. Okay, so if we take this out, so the most critical ingredient in creating high quality sound, as we'll learn today, the whole point of having a phrase like this, right? If you have a phrase, we're looking to see if the things that are inside the commas are needed to be there, right? It, it does. Is that essential or non-essential information? Well, in the last example where we had the same phrase, right? We knew that there needed to be commas because we already had one that wasn't underlined. But the key with phrases is you ask yourself, if I take this, if I take everything within the commas out, does the sentence still make sense? Other factors also affect the sound quality. That still makes sense, which is why we needed those commas. Now we were already given that, but the same thing applies with number 11. If I take out Wei Dong says, right? If I take this out, 
And I just read it as still, the most critical ingredient in creating high quality sound is the vegetable's high water content. That still makes sense, which means that we need these commas. The commas separate things that are not essential. And we'll learn more about that today. So the answer has to be A, A for number 11. Okay? We, I cannot stress this enough, guys, how important this is. Is everybody seeing this? Whether or not you know the, knew the rule today or you missed those questions today, that three out of the first 15 questions, which was 20% of the first passage, three out of 15, right? So 20% of the first passage just dealt with punctuation. And if you know those rules, they can be immediate, right? Three questions, if you typically get 40 seconds per question, right? So that would be 120 seconds. That'd be two minutes. You take two minutes is what you would get for those three questions we just answered. If you can reduce that to 15 seconds, which you can if you memorize these rules that we talked about today, now all of a sudden that's only 45 seconds, giving you plenty of time to go back and reread a question like number 12, right? To really think about what the sentence order should be. That is just, it's just so critical to, to think about this exam in that way. Does that make sense, guys? 20% on the first passage is what we're going to be talking about today. Everything that I just mentioned is stuff we're going to cover today. Okay, so can everybody give me two thumbs up if that makes sense? Did anybody get did anybody get 13 out of 15 questions right? Anybody get 13 out of 15? Or better? Anybody get 13? The point in all this, guys, is that talking about punctuation and independent clauses and phrases and all the stuff we're going to talk about today is not going to be fun. It's just not. Okay? If you got 13 out of 15, that's awesome. Okay? 14 out of 15, that's great. We have to be thinking in the way that that says, and if you're getting 13 or 14 out of 15 already, that's awesome. Now we have to think, okay, how do I get that one question I missed? Because now you're talking about being at a level that's very, very exceptional. Once you get into the 65 out of 75 range, now every question is worth a point. So now you could go from a 30 to a 34 with just four questions. So then it becomes even more important to stay very, very, very focused. Yeah, Elena, great question. So in terms of quick grammar questions, you'll find that there doesn't even need to be a time limit. It, it, so with the grammar questions, it will always be under the amount of time if you have the rule memorized. But it's a great question because if you just memorize all of them, right? If you have all of those memorized, then without even trying, at kind of at worst, in a worst case scenario, we're talking about maybe 20 seconds on average. There'll be harder grammar questions than the ones we just looked at. But the 20 seconds on average, right, which is 60 seconds, if you're given 120 seconds for those three questions and you only take 60, that still saves you an extra minute, right, to go back to questions like these. So for every three questions on grammar that you're able to identify quickly, if you memorize all the grammar rules, that means that you can spend you can spend an additional minute on every one question for every three grammar questions. Does that make sense? So it gives you such a major advantage to really know and understand and be able to identify the stuff that we're going to talk about today. It's a great question. So don't think of it too much in terms of like how much time should I be spending exactly. Just think about it in terms of if I memorize these grammar rules, then I'm going to not have to spend very much time on those. 20 seconds probably at most, and that's that's even pushing it to kind of the end. Right? If, if you get really good at this, it can be 10, maybe average of 10 seconds per grammar question because it's just that quick to identify. But again, a great question. So guys, let's table the A11 test for right now. So just hang on to it. You guys should all have that in front of you, but hang on to it. And today, we're going to go through the punctuation and run-on sections of our tutorial. So if you have your tutorial, please open that up. If you don't have your tutorial with you, or if you signed up recently and this it hasn't been shipped to you yet, I'd like you guys to open up the StarU app. Okay, StarU app. Okay, you guys should, have a, you should be able to download this. If you want to use the app anyway, you can. On the app homepage, you can click ACT and SAT practice lessons. Okay, and this is again for anybody that's not working under the tutorial, then ACT English. And then you can go to the punctuation tab. And all of the pages that you're looking at in your tutorials can also be found right here. Okay, so as soon as you guys have those open, can everybody give me a thumbs up in the chat? Elena, did that make sense by the way? Any other questions? Can everybody give me a thumbs up in the chat as soon as you guys have those open? 
And we'll be talking about punctuation to start today. And that can be found on page, like right around page 30, guys. Okay, guys, again, please make sure that you give me a thumbs up in the chat once you have the punctuation uh, tab open in the app or once you have it open Okay, it should look like this on the home page. Yeah, guys, if you have your tutorial, write as much as you want. It's yours. We're not going to ask for them back. Okay? And the only reason I said around page 30 is because sometimes I have an older tutorial version. And so mine might be a little bit ahead or behind yours in terms of page numbers. Okay. But everybody should be on punctuation. And this is what I want you guys to write down first. There's only five punctual pieces of punctuation. There's only five uh, marks of punctuation that you really need to know. We're going to talk about all of them today, but if you guys just memorize the, all of the rules that associate with these pieces of punctuation, and guess what? The way that I'm going to explain it today is even easier than the actual rule because you don't need to know that much about the rules for that particular piece. You just need to know the kind of the basics, okay? And the five that I would recommend that all of you guys write down, five or six, are commas, right? You need to know the rules of commas, when you can use a comma, okay? In this kind of same breath that falls right under this, we want to look at dashes. Okay, these are kind of subsets of commas. Dashes and parentheses, and we use those. Parentheses. Okay. We, from there, we want to also look at semicolons. Semicolons. We want to be able to know what a colon does. Colons. And we want to make sure that we understand a period. And I know periods seem like the easiest thing in the world because we right because it's the thing that we've we've known for the longest in terms of writing sentences. But really understanding what they are, knowing truly and thinking about them, can be such a major benefit on this test. And that's it, guys. I'm not kidding you. When I said this last week, right? And Sarah's mentioned it. Sarah's already mentioned it in uh, for today's lesson. How important and critical this is. If we just found that on the first passage of the A11 test that 20% of the questions, right, 20% dealt with something in this, right, a, a, something along these lines, 20%, then it's pretty critical that we learn these considering we all learned these when we were in the 6th or 7th grade. This is 6th or 7th grade grammar review. Okay, now does that make it more fun? Does that make it easier? No, right? You've got to find time to make sure that you memorize these things. But if you do, I, it will make a huge difference. You will... you. Basically, if you memorize this and, and can identify this on the real test, you are guaranteeing yourself at least a 30 on the English test every single time you sit down to take it. There are so many really easy questions on English that don't require that much knowledge that if you can knock these out and get you know 12, 12 questions right that are supposed to be harder, if you can knock those 12 out, you will find this section of the test to be so easy and that gives you such an advantage because it's the first overall section. That means that going through the rest of the test, you're going to feel great. It's just going to be like, this is not very hard. And that's where the, the, the point that I want all of you guys to be at. Okay, so like we said, oh, one last thing here that everybody really should write down is that punctuation is not arbitrary. Okay, punctuation is not arbitrary. It's not just like, oh, I'll put a comma here. It is very defined. Sarah mentioned this, that this is, these are very, very, very defined rules so that if you see a comma, just like we were talking about on that A11 test, you have to know what that comma represents, what it does within the passage. Okay? When, it, when you see something underlined, this is going to be particularly important for punctuation because it's so easy to identify. But if you're struggling with a diff difficult question, right, and it says no change, there's not actually a question to it. It just says no change is answer choice A then that, that tells you that this is a grammar question, that there is a grammar rule associated with that particular question. 
And so when you see something underlined, you've got to think to yourself, okay, what's different about these answer choices? Why is this one correct? Why is this one incorrect? Okay? That's what we've got to be thinking about. So there are a couple of things, and, and unfortunately in our tutorial and in all the companies and, and programs that I taught or have worked for in the past, everybody does a terrible job of explaining exactly what these things are. That it's so much more complicated than it needs to be. Right? We see, you see a clause, and we write these tutorials because we do want them to be somewhat you know, professional and sophisticated, but that's the advantage of this class is that I can explain very easily what each of these things does, and then if you memorize the notes and you take notes today, this should be a very easy question. Okay, so if you see the term independent clause, okay, if you see this term independent clause, and by the way, guys, we're dealing with commas first. We're starting with talking about commas and when we use commas in a sentence. If you guys see the term independent clause, all this means, all an independent clause means is that it's a full sentence. That's it. That's all you have to think about. That if you see an independent clause, it's a full sentence. Okay. That when you read that full sentence, it can stand on its own. That, it, it, that, that could be just a sentence by itself. And that if, there's, if it's not a full sentence by itself, it means that we've added some other parts, right? Some other building blocks, as we call them here. We've added some other building blocks, which is totally fine. But the independent clause itself, itself is the sentence that could just stand on its own. Okay, so we have two types of clauses. We have that independent clause, which is the full sentence we just talked about. And we have a dependent clause. And then what a dependent clause does is it, it can't stand on its own. Okay, so that's, you just need to know that. That this is very much like math and that there are just, there are building blocks to, this, to a sentence. And while you may not have thought about nouns and verbs and commas and periods and punctuation for a long time, this, it's not very hard. If you review it and you review it thoroughly, right, with no phone, right, just like we talked about with reading, you will do well on this section of the exam. So an independent clause can stand on its own. A dependent clause cannot, and for some unknown reason, somebody, this person was smarter than I was for sure, the person that invented the English language or who, who does this for a living, decided that if you have a dependent clause, and I'll show, that you, show this to you in a second, right? if you have a dependent clause followed by an independent clause, right? so you see a piece of punctuation, again, you see a comma, for example, and that comma is underlined, you want to say to yourself, with all punctuation, What's on the left side of the punctuation and what's on the right side of the punctuation? Okay, if you see a situation where what's on the left, right, is not a full sentence and the right is a full sentence, then this comma is necessary. Okay, so if you see a dependent clause followed by an independent clause, the comma is necessary. If you see the exact same independent clause and dependent clause, but they're reversed, right? You see this situation and they're reversed, then a comma is not necessary. You don't need a comma. Why? I don't know. But this is how they'll test you, right? They'll give you something like these examples, right? As he looked down, here's the dependent clause to independent clause example that we just talked about. As he looked down at his untied shoe, comma, right? Because we have a dependent clause first, Right? Greg missed the UFO that flew over his head with an independent clause. Does everybody see how this part of the sentence, Greg missed the UFO that flew over his head, that could just be a sentence on its own. And when we see this, we do need this comma. If we can identify, right, we're looking to the left of the comma, we're looking to the right of the comma, and we're saying, what are those two building blocks? Okay? And the reason this is so important is because this is the piece, right, you'll have something like this that's underlined. Okay, right, so this, this piece right here will be underlined on the real ACT. And if you see the same comma in place here, you've got to say to yourself, what's on the left, what's on the right? That comma, if it's supposed to be there, is not arbitrary. There's a reason it's supposed to be there. Or if I can't figure out that reason, then it's probably not supposed to be there. Now, if you look at the exact same two building blocks, right? As he looked down at his untied shoe, Greg missed the UFO that flew over his head. If you look at the exact same situation, Greg missed the UFO flying over his head as he looked down at his untied shoe, right? Same exact wording. There is not a need for a comma here, right? You do not need this comma. And what they'll do on the ACT is they'll test you on that. They'll put a comma in the sentence and then they'll underline it. And then one of the answer choices, similar to what we saw just a second ago on passage number one, one of the answer choices will have no comma, right? 
Can everybody give me a thumbs up if that makes sense? This one will have no comma in the same spot. And you have to be able to say, okay, what's on this side of that comma that's in there? Is this the right, is this the right rule? Okay, that's all that. And, and amazingly, guys, as it applies to independent and dependent clauses, that's it. That's all you need to know. Okay, independent and dependent clauses only use commas if there's one of each. They either have a comma at certain points or they don't, depending on which one comes first. And that's all you need to know about dependent and independent clauses as they apply to commas. That's it. That's not very hard, right? That was a five, ten minute lesson. And if you memorize that, you'll get, you'll, that's a guaranteed one question. There'll be one question on the ACT every single English test that's ever been existed, that's ever been in existence, will have this question. This rule will be tested, and it's got to be your job to see a comma and know what to do on the left or on the right. Okay? Now, does this seem like a lot of info and we're not even done yet? Maybe. But is it something that you can definitely memorize if you spend an hour this week really reviewing punctuation? Absolutely. And again, as Sarah just pointed out, that's basically free 20% of the questions on the English test. That is such a huge advantage in terms of getting you started on the right foot, given that it's the first test, first section of the overall test. Okay? So that's it. That's all you need to know about independent and dependent clauses. Now, the other time you'll, you could see a comma is if you see modifying phrases, okay? And this is the example that I was talking about where you have two commas within the sentence, okay? And what we call a phrase shows up in the middle, okay? And so the question you have to ask yourself is if I see this, and by the way, this is where the dashes and the parentheses come in as well. You could also have parentheses, okay? And you could have also have dashes, and as you guys remember from the A11 test, it doesn't matter which one it is, it just requires consistency. On the A11 passage one that we just went over, I looked later in the sentence than I saw a comma, so I knew that this one had to be a comma. But had I seen a dash instead of a comma, it would have been a dash up front. It doesn't matter which one you go with, it just means that there has to be consistency. So you look at other parts of the sentence. Okay? So a phrase could be contained in the parentheses, right? Or a phrase could be contained within these dashes. And the only thing that you need to ask yourself when you see a phrase, and by the way, it doesn't have to be in the middle of a sentence either. You could also have a phrase at the end of a sentence, phrase, right? At the end of a sentence, and then a period, or a dash, right? Phrase, and then a period. So it could show up at the end of the sentence, although it typically shows up in the middle with two. It could also have just one, right? You could have one dash, but then that would need to end with a period. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Does that make sense? So again, the only thing you have to test yourself on with phrases, the only thing you need to test yourself is, is the information in the sentence necessary? Is it essential? So let me give you an example. Chase, right? Chase, the SAT, or sorry, the ACT, the ACT teacher, Loves McDonald's. Right? And so if I say that, and I see these two, right? And on the ACT, they'll, they might underline this whole part, right? With the commas, as they did with that way. Remember, Wei Dong says that they said in that first passage on A11. Okay? And that A11 test was from 2018. I'm, I'm not, when I say that these things come up on every single test, they do. So if you see these commas, right? The first thing that you need to ask yourself is if you take that out, you can even scratch it out on the real test or in your books, right? You can scratch that part out. Does the sentence still make sense? Just very basically, Chase loves McDonald's. Yeah, that makes sense. So that means that is a phrase. And anytime we have a phrase, we have to have commas, right? Or dashes or parentheses, okay, surrounding that. So that could be, it could be Chase, the ACT teacher, right? We could put that in the middle of dashes. That's fine too. And these are defined rules, right? So every time we see these, all we have to do is ask ourselves, if we take this out, does the sentence still make sense? Now, it is so critical that you actually do that task. You have to take this out. And I even scratch it out on my own test whenever I see a situation like this to see if it makes sense. Because watch, there are certain situations, if everybody goes down to where it says 
astronomy teacher, Mr. Fermi. So this is either flip the page, oops, either flip the page or go down, scroll down on your app, but it's at the bottom of the, the next page. It says astronomy teacher. Okay, in this example, you'll see right here that we have two commas, right? Two commas surrounding Mr. Fermi. And so what they would do is they'd underline this whole portion of the, of the, uh, of the sentence, right, on the real test. Yeah, Maddie, so yeah, dashes or commas, it doesn't matter. So in this example, so dashes and commas don't matter. It doesn't matter which one you choose, you just have to be consistent. So you'll notice, right, that if, if we see a dash later on and it's not underlined on the real ACT, then we know we need a dash during, in the underlined portion. On the A11 test, you'll remember that I saw a, a comma later on or before, earlier on in the sentence. So I knew that the underlined portion also had to be a comma, right? But if it would have been a dash, I would have known that it had to be a dash. It doesn't matter which one you use. It just matters that you're consistent, that if you have one comma, you have to have another comma to close it. If you have one dash, you have to have another dash to close it. You can't do comma, dash, or dash, comma, right? Or parentheses, dash, all that kind of stuff. But again, the, the most important thing, if we know that it does, that part doesn't matter, is that we identify whether or not the information inside of those commas is necessary. If I cross out Mr. Fermi here, right, because I see the two commas, and I reread the sentence, Maddie, can you give me a thumbs up that that makes sense? Okay, if I cross that out, and I read this as astronomy teacher looks forward to reading Greg's essay, that doesn't make sense. Can everybody give me two thumbs up if, that, if you see that? If by crossing out Mr. Fermi, right, because it's surrounded by two commas, if you cross that out, can everybody give me two thumbs up if you see that that, does, that no longer makes sense? Okay? And if you do see that, then all we have to do, right, if that part is underlined on the real test, then the right answer just involves no commas. If, the, if this is essential information, right, if you take it out and the sentence does not make sense, it means that whatever was in the commas is actually essential and you do not need commas, right? Mr. Fermi in this case is essential for the sentence to make sense. So we don't, we can't put commas around his name because those commas or dashes or parentheses suggest we can take it out without affecting the sentence. And guys, this is very minute, right? But you already saw it. We talked on the first passage of the A11 test. There was a question that, that tested you on this very thing. Right? It, was, it, was, it was exactly the rule that we're testing right now. And on that one, right, we had, we had Wei, we actually had two. I, I take that back. We had two on the first passage. Right? We had the Wei Dong says one, which was testing you, was kind of truly testing you because all of this was underlined. They were testing you like they were for Mr. Fermi. In that case, we could take this out, so we kept the commas. Right? Does everybody remember that just from 10, 15, 20 minutes ago? And then on the other one, we had a comma that was not underlined later in the sentence, right? Meaning that the comma that was underlined earlier in the sentence was matching up in a non-essential phrase with this one, right? And that means that we did have to have the commas, okay? So that, that gives you the idea. But if in this situation we took out Wei Dong says and it didn't make sense, then the commas have to go away. Then we don't need commas if it doesn't make sense, like the Mr. Fermi example, this is not fun stuff, right? Talking about this ad, ad nauseum, about punctuation at this level of you know, detail is not fun. But if you just remember these rules, it's very, very straightforward. These rules are just like math. They are very straightforward, but they're way easier than math. This is like, if I see a comma, what do I need to do? If you spend an hour to an hour and a half reviewing this chapter, punctuation, and then a little bit of the run-ons chapter we're going to talk about as well, you will do exceptionally well in the English test, I promise. Okay, you just have to be paying attention to what is underlined and then ask yourself, okay, if it is, if it's low key kind of fun, that's great, if you, right? It is kind of fun to know that you can just get a bunch of questions, right? To learn about the ACT and know that it's, that it's really important, right? We know that it's an important test and to learn all of these things and then know that we can do really well, it, that part kind of makes it fun, right? That there is a strategy, that there is this, this formula that if you do these things, you will do well. If you don't do these things, and this is what I've said to parents for five years and students as well, if you don't do these things, I don't feel bad for you. I, I, you're, then you're just in the same position that I was when I was a kid where I would just you know, have an excuse for everything and eventually that catches up to you. And I learned that the hard way without realizing it younger, 
and and it stinks. And I'm trying to tell you guys, don't do that. But if you don't listen to me and, and you're like I was when I was 16, 17 years old, not listening to anybody, it's not going to work out. Right? I've done this every single day. for the Worked with over a thousand students in the last five years and done this every day for the last seven. I can tell you definitively that if you do these things, you will do well, at least on the ACT English section, which you know really raises your score in so many ways because it is that easy. It's that straightforward. And you start off on such a high note to start the overall test. Okay? Does that make sense, guys? Can everybody give me a good to go? That's it. If you can believe it, that's it for the commas. Right? Other than lists, I mean, most of you guys know what a list is at this point. Right? Other than lists, right, where we have a comma, comma, the word and, right, and then there's like three or four things. Right? That's the only other use of a comma. Okay? So that's it for commas, dashes, and parentheses. That's all you need to know. Commas, dashes, parentheses. That's it. And if you memorize and rewatch this lesson, right, you're just knocking out so many questions on the ACT English section. Okay, so that's it for those three. And next, we'll get to probably even more important, important uh, punctuation items, okay, which are these next three, and they can be classified. These are even more important, guys. Okay, the next three pieces of punctuation that you guys need to know are semicolons, semicolons, colons, and periods. That's it. And then we're done with punctuation. And if you know all this stuff, you're guaranteeing yourself 20% of the test, 20% of the English test. Right? That's it. And if you really do the math out, if you memorize all this stuff, and we've only been talking about it for like 30 minutes, 20% of a test, 20% of the English section where there's only four sections, if you memorize the last 30 minutes and you rewatch this video, this is 5% of the overall test. 5% overall test is incorporated in the last 30 minutes and probably the next 15 minutes. 5% of the overall test can be covered in 45 minutes if you guys really understand these rules. And these next ones are so easy, yet they're, they're classified by the ACT as being very difficult. So one of the things that drove me crazy when I worked at different companies and, these, and taught these different programs was this idea that you needed to know everything there was. Like we went into so much depth on semicolons, which was so dumb after looking at the test as long as I did three or four years ago when we started Star Tutors, I was like, there's so much easier ways to teach this that just that allow you to do well on this test. Now, if you want to be a great writer, right, then probably don't listen to me too much. If you want to do well on the ACT English test and keep it as simple as possible, then this is really going to help you. Okay, and then you can worry about being a great writer and all of the uses of the semicolon. But for right now, the only thing that you need to know about a semicolon is that it is exactly the same thing as a period. Exactly. Okay, if you see a full sentence and then you see a semicolon and then you, have, you should have another full sentence on the other side. That's it. That's literally all you need to know about semicolons. Is that semicolons equal periods. That's all you need to know. Now, we get students, and, and again, this is how I used to teach it in these other programs, which would be like, well, I, you know, I, semicolon technically, you have to have the two sentences have to relate. That might be true, all right? That might be true, and that's where being a great writer comes into play, right? Where they have to relate closer than when you use a period. But that, does everybody see how that statement is completely subjective to the author? Whether or not you think something is closely related versus what I think is closely related could be two totally different things. And so because of that, because it's subjective, the ACT can't test you on that. This whole, the whole point of a standardized test is to be as objective as possible, give everybody the same test and see how they all do, everything is the same. That's all objective. If you give somebody something about subjective semicolons, and again, we used to talk about this all the time in these different programs, I'd be like, they can't give you that question, and they never have. The only question they ever ask you about semicolons is, is there a full sentence on the left, and is there a full sentence on the right? If you can put a period in the place of that semicolon, then that is the right answer, and that's all you have to do. And so rather than struggling with these types of questions, when you see a semicolon in the answer choices on the ACT English test, you go to that one first. Do that answer choice first because it's so straightforward. If you see a period on the ACT English test, 
in one of the answer choices, go to that one first. Because all you have to do, and we never think about this with periods because we've, we've you know, done them for so long, right? We never intentionally on our papers in school try to do try to have improper grammar. So we just put a period after a full sentence and then we write another full sentence. But we have to remember that when we're being tested on editing for a period, we have to look at both sides of that sentence, right? And say, is there a full sentence on both sides? If there is a full sentence on both sides, then don't think anymore, right? Unless they've done something kind of crazy or wacky, right? And, and messed up the full sentence in some way, then 99% of the time, this is going to be the right answer. And I would say 100% of the time, the semicolon is going to be the right answer. Okay, does that all make sense, guys? Now, here's the question. I'd be impressed if anybody gets this. And the ACT loves to do this too. If you see a period in a semicolon in the same place, Okay, if you see a period in a semicolon in the same place on in, in one question, right, on two answer choices, you have one that has a semicolon and one that has a period, what should you do? What should you do, right? So if you have like answer choice A, answer choice A, okay, and by the way, guys, you can see all this stuff down here. I'm just writing it. Separate complete sentences. Answer choice A has a period, Right, or no change, it's a no change, but it's underlined. And answer choice B has a semicolon. What does that mean? What should you immediately do? Anybody know? What should we immediately do there? No, so right, Elena, that's what we want to do. So we don't need to see if the sentences relate right away because they're never going to test you on the semicolon usage in terms of relate. Right away, we can eliminate both of those answer choices. Can everybody give me that? Is one of the most this is this right here is. It's labeled as one of the hardest questions on the ACT English test. Can everybody see that we should eliminate both? Because again, they'll never, because it's subjective on whether or not they relate, right? You could think that they relate while I don't. And then I could argue about that for till, till the end of time, right? We, we could argue about that. It's always up to the author on how closely they relate, which one to use. So if that's the case, then we know that on one side of these, right? One side of these then there can't be a full sentence. They both have to be wrong because as it applies to just the ACT, right? This is not true if you're trying to be a really, really a great author. As it applies to the ACT, the semicolon and the period are the exact same thing. Can everybody give me two thumbs up if that makes sense, if that idea makes sense? Because if you see this, and you will see this, they love to do this, and they love to make this a really difficult question, it ends up being one of the easiest questions on the test. Because as soon as you eliminate those two, they know you're gonna, most students are going to get caught up with those two. As soon as you eliminate it, one of the other two answer choices is as clear as day, the right answer. Like you don't even have to think about it. One of C and D will be so easy to answer if you're able to get by the fact that these two can't be, they, they, if they're both right, then they're right. If they're both right, you can't circle two answers. They must both be wrong. And so the key in all of this is to actually identify. You notice that when I went through that A11 test after you guys did the first passage, I was looking for what types of punctuation I was seeing in the answer choices. You have to do that too. You have to look and see, okay, do I see a semicolon in the answer choices? If I do, then I'm going to start with that one. It's so easy. All I have to do is say, is there a full sentence on the left? Is there a full sentence on the right? If there is, boom, I have the right answer. I can circle that and move on. If there's not two full sentences, boom, I can eliminate that one. I can still move on to the other answer choices, right, and getting it and getting out of the way. Yeah, the only difference, yeah, DJ, the only difference between a semicolon and a period on this test is that in a semicolon, right, you'll see it's going to be lowercase. That's the only difference for the second sentence. And for a period, it's uppercase. That's it. But the case matter, the case doesn't matter at all. They don't test you on upper and lowercase, anything. They, they never test on it for any reason on that. 
So that's the only difference and that won't matter because again, all you're thinking about is what's on the right and what's on the left. Are they two full sentences? Okay. And so that's it. That's it with semicolons. Can everybody say good to go if you guys feel like you have semicolons and periods locked down? And beyond just saying good to go, can you guys say that you're going to, anytime you see punctuation that's underlined, can you guys promise me that you're first going to look at the answer choices to see if you have one of these three, what, what the ACT qualifies as difficult punctuation, to see if you have what we would qualify as very easy punctuation, because these rules are so defined. And the colon is even easier. If you guys can believe that, if you see a colon, it's even easier. And just like before... Right? How does everybody classify a colon? This is this is a classic ACT example. Okay, so let's say answer choice A. You see a colon in answer choice A. Who knows the rule for a colon? Who out there knows the rule for a colon? Okay, and again, I want you to think about this in a way that says we know that it can't be subjective. Right? We know that this cannot be subjective. So if that's the case, if we know it can't be subjective, what do we think? What do you guys think? Who knows that rule? Before the full sentence, dependent clause. Jane, that's, that's close. Okay, DJ, same thing. You're close. The key is what everybody... So if you guys look at DJ and Jane's comments there, the key is not what's on the right. Because what, what Elena posted as well... What Elena posted as well is right. Kayla, you're, you're right as well. Perfect. Maddie just said it perfectly. Okay, Maddie's comment there is perfect. The only thing, right, because of everything, and you guys are seeing this even with your own statements here... The only thing that's consistent there of, of from everybody is that there's something on the right side of this. So everybody always thinks of colons in the right side, right? We had a lot of good examples. We had a list, which is true. You can have a list on the right side of a colon. You can have a descriptor, right? A descriptive word. Okay, that can be on the right side. You can actually have two full sentences. Okay, you can have a colon and then another full sentence on the right side of a colon. You can have, uh, you can have a phrase. You can have a dependent clause. So the point I'm making is that on the right side of a colon, there is tremendous flexibility in what you can put. Okay, can everybody write that down? And so with what comes with flexibility is kind of the anti-standardized test. They don't want to be flexible, right? They don't want to be flexible in any way because then you have to know these things and, and it could be really anything on the right side of a colon. A colon is a very flexible piece of punctuation when you think about it on the right side. The, it, what did everybody say? Every single one of you guys made the same comment in terms of consistency. What, what, what did everybody include in their comments? Despite all of this over here being different from almost everybody that posted, what was consistent? What do you guys think? What was the only thing that was consistent, guys, across all of your comments? Right? Every single one of you guys talked about the independent clause on the left. Right? And that's true. And that's the only rule you, as it applies to the ACT. Right? All of this is true. Everything you guys said on the right is true. That's all true. But as it applies to the a ACT, we want consistency. Right? They need something that's standardized. That's literally the word, standardized test. Right? And it has to be standardized. The only thing that was standardized in all of your descriptions, while all of them were right, the only thing that was standardized was that there was an independent clause on the left. So that means that if you see a colon in the answer choices and you're committed right, to actually looking at the answer choices and saying, well, there's a colon, this is the easiest, well, and, and most, most of the time it's graded as a very difficult question on the ACT. This is one of the easiest questions ever because the only thing you need to think about on the ACT is there a full sentence on the left. So if you see a colon, you, you read it and you and you see a full sentence on the left, then it's going to be the right answer. That's it. 
Yeah, Blake, you could. And that's the thing. You could have a full sentence over here. You could have independent clause, colon, independent clause. But you could also have a million other things. The, the actual definition of what's on the right side of a colon is just an elaboration. That's the only true definition of a colon, is that you just elaborate on whatever was just said in the full sentence on the left. You're elaborating on it. But that's a very, again, flexible word, right? Elaboration could be any different, so many different things. Unlike a semicolon or a period, which it's full sentence, period, full sentence, full sentence, semicolon, full sentence, a colon is full sentence, colon, and then a million different things could be on the right side of the colon. So in terms of a standardized test, the only thing that they can really test you on and make it consistent is what's on the left side, because that is always consistent. You have to have a full sentence there. Yeah, so Elena, another great question. If you have a full sentence, right, what will the ACT never do to you? Right? Again, kind of the same thing. It's much rarer to see this. Typically, you see the semicolon and the period in the same place. Okay? Right? We said A and B could be the semicolon and the period. But to your point, Elena, right? If you see a semicolon and a colon in the same place, right? If you see a semicolon and a colon in the same place, it's probably, it's either going to be the colon, right? Because we have to have a full sentence. The colon satisfies the left side, right? There's a full sentence on the left side of both a colon and a semicolon. So if we see that, we can immediately eliminate the semicolon. Because if there's a full sentence on the left side of the colon, it has to be the right answer. We talked about that, right? So that means they're either both wrong or the colon is going to be the right answer. And it probably means that on the right side, there's not a full sentence. Or... There isn't a full sentence over here. There might be a dependent clause, and as we talked about with commas, then your comma is the right answer, and that might be answer choice C. So, again, because it's standardized, guys, in, in reality, we can actually have a full sentence, right? Colon, full sentence, or a semicolon, or a period. But because this is a standardized test, they will never give you that as answer choices. Because the reason for using each of those is different, right? The elaboration, we could always argue those things. So all you need to remember is these rules. That if you see a colon, the only rule you have to think about on the, for the ACT purposes only is that we have a full sentence on the left. For a semicolon, we have to have a full on both sides or it's not the semicolon. That, that can't be right. For a period, it has to be a full on both sides or the period can't be right. And the reason we spend so much time talking about this lesson is because if you memorize these three things, even if they deem the question to be exceptionally hard, does everybody see how simple these rules are? Can everybody give me a thumbs up if you guys see how simple those three rules are for those three pieces of punctuation? And if you see those on the test, if you see those in the answer choices on the test, go to those answer choices first because you can either eliminate it right away or it's a five second question because you, you deem it to be right. If you see a semicolon and there's a full sentence and a full sentence, boom, that's the right answer. That's five seconds and you can move on. And that's what's so powerful about these three pieces because it, it knocks out such a major portion of the test. It, it, it speeds you up so much if you really have those down and if you're actually looking at the answer choices to see if you have that on any punctuation question. It makes a huge difference. Huge, huge difference. And again, the thing that you have to think about is not how you learned it in the sixth grade or how it could be applied if you're trying to write a, a newspaper article or a, or a novel. It's only how it can be applied on the test. Again, when I was working for these other programs or other companies, I noticed that we were spending like two hours talking about semicolon and colon usage when only one situation ever showed up. And that was these situations and it continues to be the case today. And it makes sense because if it's a standardized test, they have to keep it consistent all the time, no matter what. Yeah, so Maddie, again, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying is that in, in real life, that could happen, but it will never, that situation will never happen on the ACT, right? They will never give you two full sentences where the right side is elaborating. It will just be the wrong answer because they can't test you on that. The, what, what you think of as an elaboration might be different from what I think of it as. And again, that doesn't qualify as a standardized test. That wouldn't be standardized. It would be different for you than it is for me and vice versa. And so that's not a standardized test. So they won't test you on that. 
So again, while they're an elaboration, you can use that in a million different ways on a, in a paper, in a school paper, it, it, or you could use, and, and in a school paper, you could use a colon or a semicolon in a lot of instances, right, with two full sentences. You could use either one, or you could use a period, depending on what you felt to do as the author. But on the ACT, that is not standard, right? That, that is, you're making the decision. They don't want that. They want the decision to be made by them, and so that every student has the same opportunity to see this. And again, the opportunity is simply that on the left side of a colon, right, the standardized part of a colon is that on the left side, there's a full sentence, and that's the only thing standardized about a colon. On the left side of a semicolon and on the right side of a semicolon, there's a full sentence. On the left side of a period and on the right side of a period, there's a full sentence. And that's the only standardized part of, of those three pieces of punctuation. Does that make sense, guys? Maddie, does that make sense? So again, they'll never give you the example where you have to choose between a semicolon and a period or a colon and a period or a colon and a semicolon because that differs, that's 100% that's, uh, based on what the author feels. And they can't have that when they're testing a million students. They want it all to be the same. Okay? So a lot of phenomenal questions here, guys. And again, if you can, get, if you can remember everything we just talked about over the last 15 minutes, you knock out such an important part of the test. Okay? So guys, if all of this makes sense, if you're working on the app, if all of this makes sense, that's it for punctuation. That 45-minute lesson is all you need to know for punctuation, and we're going to apply it now. So if you're working on the app, you guys can now click the tap to start button at the bottom of the punctuation lessons, or right? Or if you're working out of your tutorials, can everybody go to the next page, and you guys can try the punctuation, punctuation lesson problems on the next page. And then Sarah, for homework, for the second piece of homework, can you write down punctuation homework, which is like on page somewhere around 37 to 38, 36 to 37, somewhere in there, Sarah. Okay, but I'd like, if everybody feels good about that, I'd like everybody now to do the punctuation lesson problems, which are on the next page, or if you guys are using the app, you can click that tap to start button at the bottom of the page. Oops, sorry if you guys saw, I'm hoping nobody saw the answers there. Okay, and then as soon as you guys are done with this, punctuation, lesson problems, as soon as you guys are done, I want you guys to type done into the chat. So punctuation, lesson problems, as soon as you guys are done, just type done into the chat. Just done with those, when you guys get to the homework bubble, do not, do not, I repeat, do not do the homework bubble questions yet. You'll have those, of course, for homework. So stop when you get to the homework bubble or when you're using the app. If you're using the app, just stop when you run out of questions. Okay, and then you guys are going to type done in the chat when you're done with those six questions for the punctuation lesson problem. Sarah, can you confirm? Can you just give me a thumbs up and confirm that you got the, the homework, that home, punctuation homework? Great, thanks, Sarah.
Okay, guys, how we doing on those? Again, make sure you type done when you're done with those questions. Okay, looks like everybody's done. Everybody's finishing up, which is great. So let's go through these together, okay? Sarah, can you post the answers? Hey guys, again, so every time we see punctuation on this test, there's a defined reason for it. Okay, so if we come back up here and we're looking at question number one, Right? It says, after spending several years trying to grow a garden. Well, if we're looking at the answer choices, the first thing we notice is that we only see commas. right? So we know that we're dealing with just commas. We don't have to worry about semicolons and colon. Okay? And what we're looking for is after spending. Is there any reason, if we look to the left of that comma, do we need a comma after the, for after spending? No, we don't, right? Because that's, that's nothing that we just talked about in terms of comma usage. Okay, so for part B, it says, after spending several years trying to grow a garden. Now we have a comma right here. If we look to the left, after spending several years trying to grow a garden, that's the dependent clause we were talking about. Linda decided she'd rather just buy from, so that's it, right? That's got to be B. Because we have a dependent clause, comma, followed by an independent clause for number one. Okay, number two, Daniel, not a large man by any means. Okay, so we're looking at the answer choices. It looks like we do have a situation where we have two commas here, which gives us that phrase that we just talked about, right? So if we take this out, Daniel, right? Take out this part that has the commas around it in answer choice J. Daniel somehow seems to dominate our basketball games. That makes sense, right? There's a million different reasons why that could be. Okay, so that means that this part here, not a large man, that is, the, but that's non-essential. Because it, the sentence still makes sense if we take it out, meaning the commas are necessary. So number two is J. Okay, number three. You should watch the road, but you should also occasionally check your mirror. So let's look. Okay, so in this one, right, we have a semicolon here. Okay, and so we look to the left, right? We're looking, the semicolon's always the easiest one to start with. So if we look to the left, it says you should watch the road. Is that a full sentence? Yes. But you should also occasionally check your mirror. So this is the key. If we see the word but, just like we don't usually start a, per a sentence with a period, right? Then when you have a semicolon, you do not need the word but. And so that means that answer choice B can be eliminated. Instead, it's what we'll talk about with run on. So it's a little unfair that we haven't gotten, it to, gotten to it yet. But instead, what we need to see is we need to see a comma followed by the word but. So the answer has to be C, right? Comma. And we don't need the comma after occasionally. Okay, but you should also occasionally check your mirrors because this is a comma fanboys conjunction, which we'll talk about here in a second. Okay, does that make sense? So number three is C. Number four, she skated with amazing skill and finesse as though she had wings on her back. If we look at the answer choices, right, we see commas in different positions. But what you'll notice is she skated with amazing skill and finesse, right? So we have a comma here and we have a semicolon. So let's look, if we put a semicolon after the word finesse, let's look what's on the left, right? Because that's what we see in answer choice C. She skated with amazing skill and finesse. That is a full sentence. That's great. We have a full sentence there. So the semicolon is still alive. As though she had wings on her back. That is not a full sentence. That's a dependent clause that follows an independent clause. So not only is the semicolon off, but anything that has a comma after the word finesse is also off. Because as independent to dependent, you don't need a comma. And then we just say, do we need this comma after the word skill? No, we don't. So the answer for number four has to be J. And then finally, for number five, the weather may seem nice now. Okay, so we see a period. Let's look to the left. In just a few weeks, however, the ground will be covered with snow. So I guess we don't even have to, but that's a full sentence, right? The, week, the weather may seem nice now. That can stand on its own. In just a few weeks, however, the ground will be covered with snow. Now this is a uh, this is an unusual question 
But if I remove the word however, right, because we see two commas, does the sentence still make sense? In just a few weeks, the ground will be covered with snow. Yes, the sentence does make sense. So those commas around the word however are necessary. Even with just one word, right, that's a, what we call a transition phrase. However is just a transition word. Even if it's just one word surrounded by two commas, we want to take out that word, see if the sentence still makes sense, right? And then go with, and if it does, then those commas are necessary. And so the answer is A. Okay, does that all make sense, guys? Does that all make sense? Any questions on that? And if not, can you guys give me a thumbs up? If you don't have any questions on that, can you give me a thumbs up? Great. Okay, so the final lesson we're gonna talk about tonight, it's gonna be a really short one, it doesn't take very long, is run on. So go to, it's, it's two uh, chapters from the punctuation, so you guys can flip the page. It should be right around page like 43, and it should say run-ons in big bold letters at the top of the screen. Okay, run-on sentences. Okay. So run-ons on the ACT are very straightforward. When you have a run-on sentence, okay, it means that you have two independent clauses. Everybody should write this down. It's a compound sentence, right? Two independent clauses. Compound sentence, just for the record. Compound sentence. It's good to be taking notes on this. Compound sentence is just more than one independent clause. More than one independent clause. Okay, that's what a compound sentence is. And if we have that, we have to have proper punctuation to separate those two, the two or more independent clauses. Okay, so we've already talked about two way, three ways really to do this, but the two most common are a period and a semicolon, right? We've talked about that, where we have two full sentences on either side of a period, and actually with a period, it's just two sentences. A compound sentence with a semicolon is just a full sentence on this side and a full sentence on this side. There's one other thing that is equal to a period and a semicolon, and that's when we have, this is going back to the very basics of like five paragraph essays in fifth grade, right, is when we have a comma and a, what we call a fanboy's conjunction, fanboy's conjunction. And if we do not have one of these things, right, separating two independent clauses, then that means that we have what's called a run-on sentence, if you guys remember those. And again, guys, the reason that I know this is this is uh, sixth grade grammar, does anybody remember that old Schoolhouse Rocks video? Maybe I'm getting too old for it, but it's like conjunction, junction, what's your function? Good thing I'm not a singer, as I always say. Okay, right, but, but does everybody remember that? Does anybody remember that video? Is that still a thing? You watch it in like sixth grade, and it's literally talking about fanboys conjunctions. And that is what we're talking about here on the ACT, right? That's exactly what we're going over. So this should be really easy. Is it boring to review? Yes, but it should be pretty straightforward. And so if you have a fanboys conjunction, a comma, followed by a fanboys conjunction, and I highly encourage you guys to memorize these fanboys conjunctions, right? For, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Those seven words, seven fanboys conjunctions, are extremely important because they can also, like we saw in that last question too, from the punctuation lesson problems, they can separate two full sentences, two independent clauses. Okay, so the final thing that I want you guys to see with regards to this is that if you see two full sentences, you have to be consistent with the rules. So one of the things that the ACT loves to do to make a hard question is they love to use this word however. And rather than letting you guys, rather than um, most students, I should say, rather than really looking at what's underlined and saying, okay, if I see a comma and then the word however, what else is there, right? What else is there with the, that word? Most students think that it sounds right, so they just go with it. So let me give you an example of this. If I say, right, um, and you can see it here, uh, my, Chase, right, Chase, 
loves, right, loves McDonald's, right, Chase loves McDonald's, comma, however, however, he shouldn't go there as much as he does, right, if I write that sentence, as he does, does everybody see that if I say that out loud, Chase loves McDonald's, however, he shouldn't go there as much as he does? That sounds right. Better yet, if I gave you that exact same sentence and I put the word but, right, but there, which one would most students think sounded right? Okay, does, does the word but or however sound more eloquent? What do you guys think? And you guys can be honest, right? Does the word but or however sound more eloquent? However, right? However sounds better. But if again, if we're really, really concentrating on the rules and we look to the left of this, it says Chase loves McDonald's. Is that a full sentence? Yes. He shouldn't go there as much as he does. Is that a full sentence? Yeah, that's also a full sentence. And in order for this to work, we have, and we're, if we have a comma here, the only thing that we can have if it's a comma conjunction is a fanboy's conjunction. So even though however sounds right, it sounds better, it can't be however. The only way you can use however is if you use a semicolon. You can say however, right, comma, okay? So you can say that exact same full sentence, right? And then use the word however if you have a semicolon, but you can't use it if you have a comma. And again, because however sounds better, most students just go with that because it sounds better than the word but. But high level students, because this is a hard question, will recognize that however does not separate two full sentences unless it has a semicolon, and a semicolon just can do that on its own anyway. And they'll go with the word but, even though it sounds probably worse or less eloquent than the word however. Can everybody give me a thumbs up if that idea makes sense? This the whole idea is that we need to actually be looking at the words that are underlined, right? What is underlined? We need to look at that, and then we need to determine what the rule is. And right now, if you don't know the rule on the practice passage earlier or the practice passage we're going to finish with tonight in just a few minutes, then that's when you have to go back and memorize those rules. And if you do that, there's just no way you can get below a 30 on the ACT English test. Okay? So it looks like that makes sense. So if that does make sense, guys, please move on to the run-on lesson problems just below that. If you're on the app, you guys can click the tap to start button and start those questions. But that's it. So they're basically the whole point of the run-on section is just to reintroduce those fanboys conjunctions and, and show that they are the same thing. A comma and then a fanboys conjunction is equal to a semicolon on the ACT, which is equal to a period, right? So those are all the same things. And but all three of those say that you need a full sentence, right, on either side. Is that cool? Okay, and then just like before with the run-ons, as soon as you guys are done with the run-on lesson problems, just say done. And then Sarah, if you could add run-ons homework, if you could add that to the, uh, to the uh, homework list, that would be great. Okay, you're gonna say done as soon as you're done with these run-on lesson problems, then we're gonna go over them. We're gonna finish with one final passage. From that A11 test. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. And Sarah, I'm going to post the uh, the link to the BO4 advanced score report. I'm going to post the link. And then if you could include that link as part of that homework for the BO4, right? Plug in your answers. If you could give instructions, just short ones that say like plug in your English answers from last week's homework to the your answer column. Yeah, transition words, Elena, need a semicolon to separate, just to separate two full sentences. Two full sentences, if you see one of those transition words and not a fanboy's conjunction, you need a you need a semicolon. You can't have just a comma with the transition words, but that only applies, again, if you have two full sentences.
And Sarah, I'm gonna post this. And Sarah, if you could include this as the homework, just to, to download the BO4 score report, Sarah, from this link. You have to scroll down a little bit. And then if you could tell everybody to plug in their answers once they download it, plug in their answers to the your answer column for the English section and then send it to admin at startutors.net. And Sarah, actually, now that they're taking the A11, right? Because Sarah, they're, part of the homework is for them to complete through passages three through five on A11. Let's include that. So plug in BO4 and A11, ACT, English answers. Oh, wait, we don't have it. Never mind. Just BO4. Plug in BO4, English answers. Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Sarah, can you give me a thumbs up if that makes sense? And as soon as you guys are done, let's say done, and we'll go to the last step. Great, thanks Jane, thanks Blake. Okay, looks like everybody's kind of coming through. So again guys, when we see this in the answer choices, right, we have to think, what is each thing asking, right? Most people rarely get to see the sunrise. They are asleep that early in the morning. So we need a piece of punctuation there, right? It can't just be A, because on this side right now we have an independent clause, and on this side we have an independent clause. Okay, sunrise and they, right, and they, we don't have a comma there before the word and, still have two independent clauses, so that doesn't work either. Sunrise because they, or and because they are asleep that early in the morning. We don't, we can't add the word because here, so this now just qualifies as an independent clause followed by a dependent clause, so the answer has to be C for number one. Okay, does that make sense, guys? For number one? Okay, number two, look at number two here for a second. Okay, on number two, we see Kevin had run slowly at first, right? If we look at number two, Kevin had run slowly at first is an independent clause. He then accelerated quickly to avoid the pursuing. That one is an independent clause as well, right? So right here at that comma point, right, we look to the left and we look to the right, that is also an independent clause. So commas cannot separate two independent clauses by themselves. Has run slowly at first. Semicolon we see in the answers at first. Yeah, that's it. That's got to be G, right? On the left, we see a full sentence. On the right, we see a full sentence. And so the answer has to be G for number two. Okay. Number three, many health experts agree that young people are not active enough. If we look at this comma right here, we look to the left. Is that a full sentence? Yes. This inactivity is likely a result. That's also a full sentence. We can already tell that, right? So two full sentences. It can't be a comma. It needs some piece of punctuation. Look at that. There's the period example. And so there's two full sentences on either side of that period. Okay? And this should say in C. C. Okay, number four. Many people now watch more shows on their computers than on actual televisions. Comma and... 
I wonder if the end of the television is near. That's two full sentences, right? And we have a fanboy's conjunction. However, in number four, it says, which of the following alternatives could not be used? Well, if we have a comma and then a fanboy's conjunction, we know we need some piece of punctuation. So if we read that question correctly, we can't just have nothing there. And so without even looking at the other answer choices, we know we can't have nothing, right? We have to have something there. So answer choice for number four, G can be, that's, the, that's wrong, right? But in this way, it's right because they're looking for what cannot be used. And then for, finally, for number five, at the end of the last day of school, the students celebrated. We see a semicolon here. On this side, is there a full sentence? Yes. Okay. However, which is fine now because we have the semicolon. However, the teachers with stacks of ungraded, yes, yeah, so that works. Right? But this is the example that I was talking about earlier. That comma right there and then however with two full sentences does not work. So the semicolon has to be used. So then number five is A. Can everybody give me a thumbs up if all of that makes sense? And again, you guys will see this over and over again. 20% of that first passage that we just completed was dealing with these exact same rules. Okay? And then the final thing that I want to do today, guys, is I want everybody to bounce back to that A11 test. Okay? Everybody bounce back to that A11 ACT test. And I want everybody to go now to, to question number 16, passage number 2. Okay, so everybody should now be on passage two. And we're going to do this one in 11 minutes. And again, hopefully you guys have taken something from everything we've talked about. We're looking at ACT, right, A11 test, A11. And we're looking now at passage number two. And I hope after today's lesson, we really focus not only for punctuation, which we should all be doing better with, right? but also to really focus on what's underlined, right? Identify what's underlined and then make the correction. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Can everybody, if you guys are ready to start, we're gonna give you guys another 11 minutes on the clock. This will take us right to the end. Sarah will post the answers for this first one and then I'm, we'll see how you guys do. So right at the 11 minutes is up. We'll post the answers, you guys can check how you did and then we'll be done with class. But again, good to go if you guys have the ACT A11 test open and you're on passage two. Okay, this is gonna be question 16 through 30. Okay, guys, great. It looks like everybody's feeling comfortable with this. So without, uh, with all that in mind, ACT Passage 2, again, really try to identify, especially because I'm giving you guys more time than you'll need, really try to identify what's underlined. Okay, so the last thing we'll do here is A11 Passage number 2. Pay attention to what's underlined. Reread on those questions that you need to that add or delete something or reorganize sentences. Otherwise, you guys are going to do great. So 11 minutes and your time starts now. Keep it up. And make sure that you guys finish strong today, okay? We'll talk to you guys in 11 minutes.
Okay, again, guys, I know we're coming to the end of the class, but make sure that you stay focused. Sarah will post the answers as soon as you're done, but that doesn't mean that we should finish early. I know it's right at the end. Stay focused for four more minutes. See if you can identify as many as possible, okay, that you know what you know what the underlying portion is saying, and you really reread those questions that require you to do so. Keep it up, guys. you got about just under four minutes left. Okay, hey guys, just under a minute left. Sarah, could you make sure that you have those passage number two, A11, answers ready to post? You guys can grade them quickly. We can get out of here. Then you guys can get out of here. You guys have about 10 seconds left, you're almost done. As soon as you're done, guys, can you guys let me know how you felt? How, did you feel like you were more prepared that time? Just to identify whether or not you did better, it could be a, just, it could be a harder passage, you don't know. But it, what I'm more, what's more important is that you felt better about seeing the questions, identifying the questions, and then trying to answer them based on a real rule, rather than just you know kind of how it sounded. Okay, did anybody feel like they felt more confident with those question types? Sarah, go ahead and feel free to post those now. Okay, guys, so Sarah just posted the answers. If you guys feel like commenting and saying how you felt, how you did, that'd be great. If not, that's okay. That's all we have for class today. So you guys are free to go as soon as you have your, your tests, your passages graded. But again, if you do want to share and, and you do feel more comfortable, that's great. 
and hopefully it results in a higher, higher, uh, more questions answered correctly. Now, if it doesn't, don't worry too much because it could just be that the first passage is harder than the second one. You know, there's a lot of different things. Okay, great, Daniel. Yeah, I'm obviously very, very hopeful that you guys felt more confident on the on the punctuation stuff. That's huge. Uh, there's always going to be a lot of them per passage, right? Even on this one, we can see number 18 was punctuation, number 21 was punctuation, right? Number 28 was punctuation. So there's still a ton of those, right? 20% of the test is what we're really talking about. So hopefully we did better on those. And then hopefully again, that you guys were able to then look at, at different questions in, in more you know, analytical way than you may have in the past. Okay. Did anybody do well? Did anybody do better than they did on the first passage? Did anybody get uh, 13 out of 15 or more questions right on this one? Anybody get 13 out of 15 or more? Great, Naylor, that's awesome. Yeah, guys, again, if you just keep looking at these things, and obviously we're going to do that again at the beginning of class and do a couple more lessons so you guys feel even more confident when you see certain types of, you know, when things are underlined, you can identify it. But this is how we have to approach the English section. And if you keep working at it, eventually you just get to know all of the rules, and then it becomes the easiest section on the test by far. And that's where we want you guys to be. Okay, so it looks like everybody's doing well. I'm, I'm glad that everything went, uh, I hope everything went well today. I hope you guys learned a lot from this one. We're done with class for today. Sarah posted the answers, or posted the homework rather in the classroom group. So you guys can check out the homework there. And otherwise, we'll see you guys next Sunday for class number three. All right, guys, I hope you have a great week. I hope you have a great rest of your night, Sunday. And uh, I'll see you guys in a week. Sarah, will see you guys in a week as well. All right, guys, have a great one. Talk to you soon. And oh, and finally, let us know if you guys have any questions. Comment below this video if you guys are watching the recording. If you're re-watching it, let us know if you have any questions by commenting below this video. Or if you have any clarifying questions about homework or anything, make sure you post that in the classroom group and we'll be sure to respond. Okay, guys, great job today and we'll talk to you soon.